Here's an idea. Technology does not invite the invasion of your privacy. If you spend even some time on the internet, and given what I know about you, I'm guessing you do, you've probably already heard of Heartbleed. And if you haven't, I have some bad news. You should open up another tab and start changing all your passwords while I explain why you need to change all your passwords. Basically, a bug in OpenSSL, a very widely used library that provides cryptographic functionality across the internet, makes it so that any enterprising no good nick can read the contents of a particular part of a server's memory. That stuff might be server gobbledygook or uninteresting log files or nothing or your password or personal information or the certificates used by the server to prove that a connection is securely encrypted. Whoops. And hey, no big deal, but maybe the NSA, you're gonna love this, maybe they knew about it and were using it since like 2012, just to see what you were up to. It's fine. Anyway, from a technological standpoint, Heartbleed is incredibly fascinating. And if you wanna know more, Sean at Computerfile made this awesome video with Dr. Stephen Bagley that you should watch. What we're gonna talk about is how Heartbleed, as the latest in a long string of privacy concerns, can make us feel a little vulnerable. Like, okay, sure, many parts of the internet behave as public spaces, but we also have these other spaces on the internet that we think of and treat as private. Like your email account, probably your bank, website, that YouTube channel where you only upload private videos of you singing Queen into a wooden spoon. And one common reaction by tech alarmists, internet skeptics, and probably at least one of your uncles at Thanksgiving, a reaction to the helplessness felt when we find out that these things are not as secure as we originally thought, is to say, well, we all should have known. We chose to use this technology for our sensitive data. Joke's on us. The nugget being that by choosing to use certain services, you are choosing to have your privacy violated. It's an argument you might have also heard in relationship to airline travel and the TSA. This is a familiar attitude towards big corporate entities like Google, Facebook, and Amazon. They're huge, they have all your data, they can profit from it, and so they will. Oh, and also maybe they'll canoodle with a vague yet menacing government agency. But Heartbleed is now causing some folks to ask, as the web grows, will it necessarily become less secure? In a piece for the New York Times titled exactly that, Furhad Manju says, we have decided as a society to rush headlong into a world ruled by digital devices, continually weighing convenience versus safety. We are constantly storing more of our important information on new hardware run by complicated software. And all of it is increasingly interconnected, which makes the whole ecosystem more vulnerable. Manju takes the hopeful approach that as these factors become more visible and impactful, the public and the industry will take them more seriously. But for others, it raises a bigger question. Technology, is it good? Or is it whack? Do we need to interrogate our fundamental choice to even be using potentially vulnerable services? By using the internet, are we choosing to have our privacy invaded? I think no, but first off, I don't have much of a soft spot for you were asking for it style admonishments. By claiming this kind of thing is the user's fault, we effectively absolve all the miscreants using privacy exploits. Sure, if no one were using technology, then we wouldn't be having this conversation and the problem would be solved, but that's not so much a solution as it is an alternate universe. Because honestly, how much are you choosing to use technology? You did have a choice when signing up for an email account or a dating website, and so maybe you tried to choose the most secure and respectable one. So yes, you did have a choice in that respect. And I suppose you also chose to have an email address in the first place. You chose to have a computer and a bank account, and you choose to pay taxes every year and wear shoes every day. What I'm trying to say is that if we are choo-choo choosing to do these things, then we are doing so within a framework of much larger and much, much more complex choices. Like choosing to be comfortable, choosing a safe or convenient life, choosing to align ourselves with the expectations and preferences of our social group and society, choosing to fit in. I'm not saying that anyone is forced to do any of these things, and I'm also not saying that we're isolated from the ramifications of using technology technology, having a bank account, or wearing shoes. Only that insofar as this is a choice, it's a very different kind of choice from the one that you make when standing in front of the Ben and Jerry's freezer at the grocery store. I'm a mint chocolate cookie man myself. When a teacher asks you for an email address to send you assignments, you can choose to say that you don't have an email address. You can choose to do zero of your banking or shopping online, but let's be honest, 
Will you? Of course, for many people, there is no choice. Social or economic factors prevent them from using widely adopted technology, and so the choice is made for them. In the way that much of the US, for instance, is put together assuming that residents have a car, much of modern life and even some modern ways of thinking are built upon assumed access to the network. And when someone doesn't have that access, we consider it, rightfully so, I think, a problem that needs solving. So before we even ask if by using technology we are somehow choosing to have our privacy invaded, maybe we need to know to what degree we are even choosing to use technology. I think for a lot of us, we're not, or we are not simply choosing. You could absolutely choose to get rid of your phone, computer, or internet, but by extension, for better or worse, you would also be making the much larger choice to uninvolve yourself from, well, a lot. So maybe really what the choice argument is saying is that having your docs hacksword is an inevitable consequence of using the internet. Or if it's not, we should think of it as one. And I don't know, maybe it is an inevitable consequence, but at least as far as popular culture is concerned, portrayals of the network have always gone hand in hand with those of a clever infiltrator. The insecurity of the internet is probably one of its biggest and most popular features. If a bank gets robbed and your safety deposit box is stolen, you probably wouldn't think to yourself, ugh, shoulda known. But on the internet, if someone hacks the Gibson or compromises the mainframe and steals all of your data, well that, that's just what happens. Run antivirus. Give me a systems display. What do you guys think? By using certain services, are you choosing to have your privacy invaded? Is the internet necessarily insecure? Let us know in the comments. And after you're done changing all of your passwords, please subscribe. The passwords are far more important. Comments, you're tearing me apart. Let's see what you guys had to say about Nanar. Okay, so first and foremost, a million movie suggestions. So for people who need more things to watch, get a pen and a paper ready. I'm only gonna say the ones that I'd never heard of. So here we go. Chris Menning, who is an old friend of mine, suggests Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, and a lot of other people suggested that too. Uh, Adele Bussinger suggests Manos, The Hands of Fate, and also links to an LA Times article about why we love bad movies. That was really interesting. Um, be the Trouble You Want recommends Pool Boy, Drowning Out the Fury, and John Oku uh, recommends The Lost Skeleton of Cadavra, which a, bu a bunch of other people also recommended, and it looks just ridiculous. Tara Clementis and a bunch of other people were aghast that last week's episode contained no mention of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and I will tell you why. It is because I think Rocky Horror Picture Show is a legitimately good movie. It's not a good bad movie, it's not accidentally a bad movie, it is just a good movie. And, you know, it is a, it is campy, but it is a tribute or an homage to camp. And it's for that reason that I didn't mention other films uh, like uh, Black Dynamite and Snakes on a Plane. I think that these movies are, actually, they are good. They are just... Um, paying tribute to another kind of movie, but that makes them, in my mind at least, it takes them out of the running for consideration being of being good, bad, or nanar, or accidentally good, or, you know, other such things. But my name isn't Mark. I'm fed up with this world! Okami G15 raises a really interesting point about Nanar and says that even if you could make one on purpose, that doesn't necessarily automatically mean it will become as popular as something like Troll 2, and that it requires such a bizarre collusion of events to make those kinds of movies the cultural touchstones that they are. And yeah, this sort of gets at the question of making any kind of celebrated thing on purpose, right? This idea works just as much for good movies as it does for so bad they're good movies. You can make the best thing and it could just languish in obscurity for eternity. God, that was, that's depressing. Flawless Logic brings up The Tim and Eric Show, which we talked about actually a little bit on the IRC last week, and yeah, Tim and Eric might be the most complicating example of this kind of media because it really is so earnestly what it is. And I don't know, the something about the the satire and the parody that they engage in almost takes it completely out of consideration for me, but then I just, I would love to know how their brains work, I think is what I'm trying to say. Yes, I don't know, what do you guys think? Where does Tim and Eric, where does the Tim and Eric show fit in this whole thing? I, I have no idea. Relatedly, Cyan Sonata brings up Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff as another kind of complicating piece of media, and 
Yeah, I mean, maybe someone, if someone does have an almost superhuman sense of irony, they might be able to achieve the distance needed to do this on purpose. And yeah, maybe Andrew Hussey is that person. Flishlish writes a really insightful comment about the nature of goodness as it relates to creative endeavors, and that if something accomplishes what it sets out to do, it is therefore, almost by definition, good. And so for a movie like Sharknado that accomplished exactly what it wanted to, badness kind of doesn't even factor into it, which I think is, that's a good insight. Um, and relatedly, the conversation between uh, Rudy the horror rat and the sorrel that takes place in response to her comment is, is also really great, so you should check it out. We put links to this one and all the other comments in the doobly-doo. I'm about to really embarrass Morgan by asking him this question, and he has to use this take, Morgan. Whatever happened to the caps lock poetry? He's smiling uncomfortably, so I think that that means we're gonna, we'll make it happen. We will! Okay, there we go. This week's episode is brought to you by the hard work of these bleeding hearts. We have a Facebook, an IRC, and a subreddit. Links in the doobly-doo. The tweet of the week comes from Wesley the Futile, who drew an awesome caricature of my big silly face. And hey, guess what? We won a Webby for first person. flabbergasted. And for this week's record swap, we will be replacing the Clockwork Orange soundtrack with the soundtrack to Fantastic Planet, or Le Planet Sauvage. And actually, a little story about this record. I, this is, I have owned this record longer than most other records that I have. I've, I bought it at a flea market when I was maybe 13 or 14. And up here in the top left-hand corner, it says Kathy Lund. And I have always wondered who Kathy Lund is. Where is Kathy Lund? What is she up to these days? I have no idea. Kathy Lund, if you're out there, uh, I have your record. Um, anyways, so adios, A Clockwork Orange, and welcome, Fantastic Planet.